Um, it is wonderful to be here in Stockholm, and particularly at such a critical time. I mean, there, the cities are facing some of the most dramatic challenges, uh, and it's a very exciting time uh, in transportation. Before we get started, I want to get a sense how many of you have been to New York City in the last five years? Wow. Okay. How many of you have been in the last two years? Jeez. How many of you have been in the last year? Oh my God. Well, clearly our tourism program is working. Uh, so, those of you that have been to New York know just how big the changes have been in the last several years. Um, and those of you, the two of you that have not come, uh, consider this, uh, it's your official invitation. Uh, but in just a few years, New York has really uh, become a different city. Uh, we have new designs on our streets, uh, new vocabulary. New Yorkers have become fluent in this new language. They talk easily about traffic calming, about bike shares, about wayfinding protected lanes. And once known for its mean streets, uh, the streets of New York have gotten much nicer in close to real time. And like you, we have a lot of infrastructure. You know, when I talk about a lot of the changes that we've done in New York City, they say, oh yeah, well it's New York City. And you sort of forget that it's a city that's got 6,000 miles of streets and it's got 789 bridges. Like you, we have a lot of waterways to cross. We're really kind of our own little archipelago uh, in New York City. And we also have the largest passenger ferry system uh, in the world. And so I say this because it's important to understand that you, you're not going to be able to innovate until you take care of the basics. And so we were able to make the changes that we were able to make because we really did, you know, the kind of maintenance uh, that needed to be done for our critical uh, infrastructure. But you know of, about that here. And as a cultural uh, and economic capital uh, of the country, you know, you have a lot of infrastructure to manage here in Stockholm. And it's, you know, it's a city with 700 years. It's uh, astonishing for us. We're just really just the adolescents over there. Um, but, and you've really tackled big things. Uh, and I think it's really exciting. But you're also growing really fast. You have half a million people that are expected to land here uh, in the next, uh, by 2030. So one of the fastest growing cities in Europe. And uh, with congestion pricing and pedestrianizing your core, you know, you've done a lot. And as you've seen, it takes a lot of hard work to get beyond the sort of dashboard view uh, of your streets that we've had for so long. You know, city planners and city leaders would look at um, scenes like this and say, yep, this is working just fine. And it's, it's sort of hard to remember that their streets weren't always like this. Um, they were shared streets. Um, they were almost extensions of our stores and our, and our living rooms. Uh, this is actually Lower Manhattan in 1900. And um, it actually wasn't that different right here. And this shift to the automobile didn't just happen magically. It actually happened by design. Um, and you can see this from these planning documents for New York City from 1922. I love these. Because here is the first step in the plan. Pedestrians are removed. <laughs> Second step, cars invade. This was our plan. You know, it's like Venice, but with, you know, traffic sewers instead of canals. And, you know, so by the 1920s, it was hard to even imagine crossing a street like here in Grand Army Plaza in Brooklyn. And it really only got worse from there. The industrial design that we uh, had, the, the main consideration in designing our streets really came from Detroit. And uh, it's really shaped cities uh, around the world. And automakers spent much of the 20th century convincing us that we had a love affair uh, with the automobile. And in fact, I really think it was more like an arranged marriage. <laughs> and this worldview was really focused on moving as many cars as possible from point A to point B and missed all the other ways that people used their streets. Uh, this is uh, Times Square in the 1950s, and uh, as you can see, 60 years later, not much has changed. 
Um, it's like our streets have been in some kind of suspended animation. Uh, and you think about how much has changed in our lives with technology. I mean, just every part of our lives has changed. Um, but somehow we're stuck with this dial-up connection uh, on our streets. And New York finally shattered this uh, with Mayor Bloomberg in 2007 when he launched the city's long-range long sustainability plan called Plan YC. And it recognized that if we were going to continue to grow and thrive and accommodate the million more people that we're expecting in New York City by 2030, we needed to change the way that we did business. To work toward the streets that we wanted and not just respond to the kind of uh, stone age uh, system that we inherited. Um, but to make real change, you need vision and you need political courage and you need leadership. Um, at like the mayor you have here and the fact that all of you are in this room today. Uh, and you can't change the big ship of a city if you don't have a plan for where you need to go. And one of the first things that uh, I did at New York City DOT was to create a, s a strategic plan for the agency. Shockingly, you know, for all the decades before, there was no strategic plan for the Department of Transportation. So we created a new roadmap um, that highlighted the projects, the policies, the programs, and benchmarks so that people like you, people like New Yorkers, could hold us accountable for what we did or did not accomplish uh, with this plan. And it's a process that you know well through your own uh, walkable city plan. Our strategy is focused on making it easier to walk, um, making it faster and more convenient to get around by bus, um, to make our streets safer and more enjoyable. And the ideas uh, here aren't new, but what was new was the speed with which we delivered them. Um, New Yorkers actually had gotten to a point where they actually didn't believe that change was possible um, on New York City streets. They were kind of a skeptical lot anyway. Um, but really, when you think about it, we're on our fourth groundbreaking of the Second Avenue subway. You know, we weren't able to finish that in over 60 years. So not surprisingly, people said, yeah, yeah, Plan YC, Greater Greener New York, it's not going to affect me. Um, so we moved very, very quickly. Uh, and instead of wading through years and years of planning studies, um, we used paint and stones and planters to change the use of these spaces uh, in close to real time. And the proof wasn't a computer model. The proof was actually uh, the real world performance. And if it didn't work out, we could put it back just the way it was before. And these quick changes made the idea of a greater, greener New York a tangible reality. And we worked citywide. This is, uh, for those of you that have been to uh, Dumbo, this is downtown Brooklyn. Uh, we did this over a weekend. Just took an underutilized parking lot, uh, painted it, stones, tables and chairs, uh, and voila, new public plaza. Um, Lower Manhattan, like many streets of your city, very narrow streets, um, uh, very narrow sidewalks, not a lot of room for cafe life. So we took away parking and did this, these pop-up parklets. Places like Madison Square, very famous for the Flatiron Building, beautiful piece of architectural history uh, in New York City, was also famous for having the widest intersection uh, in New York. And so we closed it and changed it. And it's interesting that New Yorkers have such a hunger for public space that when we put out these orange construction barrels just marking off the space, within two hours we had people, this is an art class, just in the streets, you know? Nothing there, you know, but vit, they're there. It's like Star Trek, vit. All the people started to come. And today, it is one of the most popular public spaces in the city, which is extraordinary because we have this fabulous park, uh, Madison Square Park, right next door, and people don't go sit in the park. People love to sit, you know, in this new uh, plaza at Madison Square to feel the energy of the city and the pulse of the city. It's a very different experience. And these new public spaces are in demand all around the city. This is uh, in Corona, Queens. Um, we created uh, more pedestrian space and safer crossings at our bridges. This is at the Williamsburg Bridge. Um, just paint, just planters moving very quickly. And in six years, we created 60 plazas in every neighborhood of the city. Um, and you can see this on the map, um, and very different partnership models for different uh, communities, and we can talk about that later in the Q&A. 
Um, the program was designed so that after marking out the space, we moved forward with a, a temporary plaza and then the permanent plaza. So on the top left is the street as it was, then we marked it out with the um, uh, temporary materials, and then you can see the um, permanent on the bottom. And the program went well beyond just creating plazas. This is on Broadway, just south of uh, Columbus Circle at 59th Street. Um, and we created this new road order uh, on our streets. And you can see the difference here, um, which is a great new space. I mean, just this really horrible utilitarian looking street. And now it's great for uh, local retail, restaurants. Um, it's been a big home run. Oh, no. Love that. I knew there was a reason you were here. Thanks, Noah. <laughs> um, so pro with project after project, it became clear that better streets are better for business. Um, taking a traffic choke street like right here, this is right in front of Macy's at 34th Street. Um, and we created a kind of miracle in, on 34th Street. We saw foot traffic increase 6% in just the first six months of the project. And probably the biggest example of what we did uh, was in Times Square. And you've seen what we did in Times Square. Uh, before, 90% uh, of the road space was dedicated to cars and only 10% to people, despite the fact that 350,000 people a day walked through Times Square. And it was it, people traded the safety of the sidewalk for the street just to get by. And you know how New Yorkers are. We're sort of crazy. We really want to get around in a New York minute. And if we can't get around fast, then we start to vibrate. You know, it's, it's horrible. And so when, when people come from New York, they, the tourists come and they're walking and they're walking like four abreast, you know, looking up at the, you know, what's going on there. It drives us insane, you know, like move out of the way. But there was really no space to move out of the way. So, you know, we needed to do something about this and we created this uh, new project. But, you know, it's, it's, it's so interesting to me. <laughs> when I started the job, we, I started doing all this re reclaiming um, space for pedestrians. And it, it, it's a big problem, the crowded sidewalks of New York. And so early into my tenure, this group of guerrilla artists went to Fifth Avenue, and they dressed up in New York City DOT garb, cap, vest, whole thing. And they went to Fifth Avenue, and they painted a, a strip on Fifth Avenue. And on one side, they wrote visitors, and on the other side, they wrote <laughs> New Yorkers. And people did it. They followed it. <laughs> It was unbelievable, and I got all these calls like, that's a great idea, you know? <laughs> Thank you for that. So anyway, it just gives you a sense of the hunger that people have. Um, so Times Square, it was dangerous, it was ugly, it was underperforming, and so in 2009, I brought Mayor Bloomberg the idea of closing Times Square to cars from 42nd to 47th Street. And, you know, we were gonna do it as a pilot project. It was an election year, if you can believe it, an election year. And um, he didn't blink. Well, he did blink, actually. He uh, said, you want to do what? Um, but, you know, one of the hallmarks of his administration uh, was it's all about the data. You know, he's a data-driven guy. And, and experimenting and trying big new ideas, very much a part of his DNA. Uh, but we needed to have the data. In fact, he's got a line, uh, trust in God, everyone else bring data. And I think it's a, good, it's a good strategy. So we brought lots and lots of data. We measured the safety, the mobility, the economic performance uh, of the project. And we told everybody, uh, all of the stakeholders, when you think about it, it's the heart of the theater district, a lot of you know, very traditional folks there. And if they, it didn't work, we'd put it back. Uh, we made it clear that it was a pilot, and it really reduced the anxiety. And I can't say enough about this, about trying new things, about showing people how, what can happen. Because if you are clear about the fact that if it doesn't work, you'll put it back, you know, there's just much more acceptance uh, to the idea. And people can see and touch and feel the changes rather than uh, looking at a drawing. Um, but like any big project, there, there were big surprises along the way. So, you know, we have this project, we got it all done, put out the orange construction barrels, you know, we're all set to go, and then suddenly we looked out there and realized, huh, there's nothing in the space. It's like two and a half football fields full of space, but there's nothing there. What, we got to do something. And we realized, so we, like, went to a hardware store and bought beach chairs. And so we put these beach chairs down, uh, and these beach chairs 
became the talk of the town. Everybody didn't talk about the traffic or that we closed it to cars. They just talked about the beach chairs. So the next big project you have, just bring the beach chairs. That's all you need, and, and you will be fine. Uh, so it was a big success, and people came out and used the space immediately, and it became a symbol of the new Times Square. People use it day and night. It's, it's used for uh, art and dance and music performances of all kinds. Um, am I going the right way here? Yeah, big safety mobile uh, benefits, 80% fewer people walking in the street, 63% reduction uh, in injuries, even as uh, travel times uh, improved through the, the district. When you think about it, when you're allocating your streets better, where you've got you know, enough, streets, uh, enough space for the pedestrians, you know, they, that also improves the traffic flow, you know, how, how you get through. And importantly, it was an economic blockbuster. Six new stores moved in, and according to Cushman and Wakefield, it became one of the top ten retail locations on the planet. So we were able to do great things. We do yoga in Times Square, volunteering in Times Square, open uh, air opera in Times Square. Um, you can see the evolution here from sort of endless asphalt uh, to a thriving plaza with these temporary materials. And then we move forward. All of our projects, once we go through temporary, move through the uh, permanent construction process. I don't know what the time frame is here, but in New York it takes about five years to get through the construction process. So this al allowed us to move much, much quicker. If we hadn't done it this way, I think we'd just still be talking about the plans for uh, Times Square. Um, so when you come next, um, this is what you'll see, um, and this is the final uh, program. And it became this big success with New Yorkers who you know, previously would not be caught dead uh, in Times Square. And uh, it really has remade uh, the image uh, of the city, uh, certainly in that part of town. In fact, I, I actually still have one of the beach chairs in my office today. It's a little piece of uh, New York City uh, history. So it's interesting that you're now seeing this approach in cities all around the world. Uh, in Los Angeles, which is really the car-centric capital of, of the United States, even Los Angeles is uh, doing these kinds of projects in front of its Grand Central Market. You know that there is a seismic shift going on when cities like Los Angeles are making these kinds of moves. Um, you're seeing new kinds of spaces in Philadelphia, Buenos Aires, in Auckland. This is in the heart of Mexico City in the Zocalo. Uh, we worked with uh, Mayor Moncera on this program. Um, so clearly the language of sustainable streets is universal. And I think it's important that the blueprint for cities is also about building in new ways to get around. Uh, people are not going to walk or bike unless they feel safe doing so. And so in that sense, safety and sustainability uh, go hand in hand. Um, and this is especially true with biking. Uh, if you create a safer infrastructure, people will bike. So we took streets like this, which basically the message on this was bike at your own risk, and we transformed it uh, into this. You can see uh, the change. And transforming these kinds of projects, these kinds of projects has, have a much bigger impact than just improving uh, the environment for cyclists. Uh, where we put in protected lanes, we saw injuries to all users go down 50%. And retail sales for the stores along the corridors increased 49%. So these projects are part of an economic development strategy for the city. We created an extensive palette of designs. I often get these questions about, well, yeah, you did it in New York because your streets are so wide, so you can do it. My, streets, my city's different. We have narrow streets. We have you know, mixed streets. We have all sorts of different streets in New York City, and we, had, we tailored our toolbox of solutions to meet the specific needs of each street. So when we had enough room, uh, for uh, buffer, uh, we could put in a um, high visibility uh, green uh, bike lane. On wider streets, we were able to put in the parking protected lanes. We put in two-way uh, bike lanes to um, connect uh, the network, and we took advantage of the infrastructure that we had all around. Medians, um, we were able to um, snuggle up to with the bike lanes. Um, this is one of my very favorite projects. This is First Avenue. You, how many of you have been to First Avenue? 
Okay, excellent. So this is what F First Avenue was uh, eight years ago. It was like the wild west of traffic, you know, this north-south uh, uh, chaos um, throughout the whole length of Manhattan. And we created a great new street. See, I love this. So, you know, it's now easier to, we've got the parking protected lane, we've got the three lanes of moving traffic, we've got the bus lane. Uh, on the day that we launched Bike Share, it was one of the highlights of my life. Um, and I, uh, you know, which says a lot probably about my life. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm riding up the bike lane and I'm in my protected lane and, the, and the, I'm flowing along and the traffic is moving and the buses are in their lanes and there's birds are singing and there's a rainbow. It was unbelievable. So. We created this great street, and crashes went down 40% for all users, and bike ridership doubled. So, but there were some bumps in the road. Shockingly, not everybody agreed with the entire program. So, I found that when you push the status quo, the status quo pushes back. And probably our, the biggest ground zero uh, that we faced was right here at Prospect Park West in Brooklyn. Uh, and it was a very dangerous speedway. You can see the, the wide streets. And um, it actually be, it was like a jetway. You know, cars just whoop, prepared for takeoff. And so the community asked us to fix it. And so we did. And we put in this two-way protected bike lane. And um, speeding went down 75%. And um, bike ridership tripled. But it became this huge political football. One Brooklyn paper called this, right here, just this, the most contested slab of concrete outside the Gaza Strip. <laughs> we do tend to get excited in New York. Um, but the success of the project uh, outlasted the headlines. And one common complaint that we heard was that the more cyclists that you're going to have on your streets, the more dangerous your streets are going to be, when in fact the opposite is true. The more cyclists that you have on your streets, the safer your streets become. If you want a safer city, build bike lanes. In less than seven years, we built 400 miles of on-street bike lanes and created an interconnected network uh, to our bridges and across the city. Uh, it was this true biking backbone. So you see, this is it in 2007, and this is it in 2013. I love this. So easy. Just lines on the map, right? <laughs> anyway. Um, but I also can't say enough about the advocates who helped push for this. Um, whenever we got into uh, trouble, we would see, re receive uh, dozens of support letters from the community. Uh, great community activists from transportation alternatives. Um, this guy on the bottom right, you may recall, Clarence, Clarence Erickson from Street Films, who did a lot to publicize uh, what we did. Um, and what we found at the end of the day was that people were far ahead of the press and the politicians. And you can see the stats. This is at the end of the Bloomberg administration. You've got 73% support for bike share. You've got 72% of support for pedestrian plazas, 64% support of the bike lanes. If the bike lanes were running for mayor, they would win in a landslide. <laughs> so today what we're seeing is that city planners around the country and around the world are adopting the same kind of tools for their streets. This is here in Atlanta, in uh, Indianapolis. Oh, no, this is Denver, sorry. This is Indianapolis. It's kind of become this biking capital of the Midwest. Uh, Pittsburgh, Austin. You don't really think of Texas as being a big uh, bike capital, but it is. Seattle, Vancouver, London, Lima. And I think you know about this place, closer to home, uh, where biking has doubled. Uh, over the last 10 years. And I think all of these cities are showing that walking and biking and transit can play well together if you don't make them uh, fight over the scraps. And of course, nothing excites a city of would-be cyclists more than a bike share program. And we launched this uh, two years ago 
uh, with Mayor Bloomberg on Memorial Day, and uh, it's been a great home run. Uh, I remember when we were launching this, uh, you know, th these pictures, you've got like all these cameras, you know, taking pictures, and uh, it turns out, this is off the record, right? So, no, not off the record, okay. Well, it turns out that um, sometimes technology doesn't work. Uh, and so there was a fear from some of the folks at City Hall that if we launched this program and the mayor put the key in that it might not work. And so the mayor was adamant about like, no, because you know, they asked me to do it. And I, the mayor was like, no, if it doesn't work for me, it's not going to work for 8.4 million New Yorkers. I'm going to do it. And so everybody was very nervous. So actually, most of the pictures, I'm, I'm standing like this, praying to God <laughs> that the system worked. And after two years, it, it is a total home run. 15 million trips taken, over 25 uh, million miles ridden. And one of the big reasons for uh, the success is the siting of the program. These, these stations are very close together, every block, block and a half. And we had a big public involvement uh, program. 65,000 New Yorkers participated um, in siting the stations, picking where they wanted them to go. And it's, it's really exciting. We're at 7,000 bikes now, and we're going to go to 10,000 bikes at the end of the year. Uh, and you know something about that here. You have one of the oldest modern bike share systems in the world. Uh, and I think the challenge is, is to keep improving uh, the system. And you know, is your network dense enough? Uh, is it convenient enough? Uh, is it available enough? Is it in low-income neighborhoods? I think that any city that's working to build a world-class bike share system needs to uh, answer these fundamental questions. And for all of the headlines that the bike and plaza programs generated, uh, it's easy to forget that investment in bike and pedestrian infrastructure is one of the most cost-effective investments that you can make. In New York, our spending was less than 1% of our overall budget was on bike and uh, plaza programs. And yet it was 99% of our coverage uh, in the press. But these are projects that any city, large or small, uh, can afford to tackle. In fact, I think you can't afford not to uh, invest this way. And it's certainly less expensive than the millions for the bypass project. Um, we can talk about that later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because, you, and you all know this, the fact is we are not going to build our way out of congestion by building more roads. Um, we have to make the ones that we have more efficient and more effective. And that's what we did with Select Bus Service, which is New York's version of um, bus rapid transit. So we took streets like these um, and uh, redesigned them to make our buses move faster. Nothing really fancy. Uh, Off-board fare collection, bus-only lanes. Uh, we enforce the lanes by cameras. So if you got a ticket if you were driving in a lane. Travel time was reduced by 20%, ridership up 10%. Uh, it was really important to show that we could move quickly, that we could do something with our bus program. I mean, New York City has the largest fleet of buses in North America, and we had the slowest bus speeds. In fact, my traffic engineer used to say that the only way to get across town was to be born there. <laughs> <laughs> so that's just not a great strategy. So we moved fast, and we rolled out seven lines in six years uh, across all five boroughs uh, in parts of the city that hadn't seen transit improvement in decades. And just like with our plaza and our bike lanes, uh, more riders and more foot traffic was, was much better for business. In our first uh, uh, project uh, in the Bronx uh, on Fordham Road, we saw retail sales along the corridor increase some 71%. Um, and it put a few more holes in the myth that free parking and, and traffic lanes are the drivers of economic success. Cars don't shop at stores and restaurants. People do. So, here in Stockholm, uh, you're started down that uh, same road with the new uh, blue bus uh, lanes and the dedicated signal priority. And I think it's important also to note that these projects don't stop at the curb. Um, we need to create streets that are friendly and attractive um, with some attention to aesthetics and design. And our streets should look like somebody cares about them. Um, and you can see this with our new uh, bus shelter designs, 
with our new bike shelter designs, with our new stands, um, and our benches. Um, a few years ago, we did a survey, and we found that, you know, as you've, as you've seen, as you've walked, New York is a great walking city, but there's very few places to sit down. You know, in fact, you usually see people, even families, all kind of gathered around a fire hydrant, you know, just trying to get a little rest in. And so that is not the mark of a world-class city. So we changed that, and we had a design competition. We put out 1,000 new benches uh, all across the city. We also launched a new design competition for our bike racks. Um, our bike parking racks used to look like there was some, you know, crazed plumber on acid, you know, like putting them into the concrete. And so now we have some beautiful designs. We've replaced them. We've got 8,000 uh, that we've just installed. Um, we also really worked hard to create a new navigation system for people on foot, created a new wayfinding system. Um, studies show that uh, New Yorkers, at any given time, New Yorkers are lost 10% of the time. <laughs> and that's just the New Yorkers that will admit it. So probably didn't ask very many women. Um, but we created this comprehensive system uh, that works in all kinds of environments, small streets, bigger streets. Uh, we have it actually on our uh, select bus service routes, uh, and it's the new map of the city. And uh, it's got that same design vocabulary as our newsstands, as our uh, bike and bus shelters, and it also is part of our, the real-time information system that we've got on our uh, bus routes. Now, with 6,000 miles of streets and 7,000 miles of sidewalks, um, DOT is a great gallery for art. And so we looked at our streets as showcases for local artists and designers. And we partnered with artists uh, to bring life to our new public spaces and created new opportunities for New Yorkers to see their streets in a whole new way. We started this summer streets program where we closed Park Avenue uh, uh, on Sundays to cars, seven and a half miles of car-free streets. How many of you have been to summer streets? Ooh, so now I gotcha. So come to New York City in August, uh, any given Sunday, and uh, join the crew. This is what you'll see. You'll have some fun along the way. We have zip lines. Um, we have pop-up pools made out of dumpsters. Don't worry, they're triple filtered. Um, right in the shadow, it's pretty cool, sh swimming in the shadow of Grand Central. Um, we also played with the canvas uh, of our bridges, with I uh, light installations. We worked with kids and um, uh, local prisons and had um, folks come out and uh, paint new designs on New Jersey barriers, uh, transformed utilitarian uh, construction fences, created spaces that livened up neighborhoods and commissioned uh, local artists to take our streets in whole new directions. I love this, this is in Times Square, this is actually uh, Molly Dilworth. She took a NASA map that had the heat signature of Times Square and, and translated it, in, it into color uh, called Cool Water Hot Island. And a big part of this new road order uh, includes measuring the impact uh, of our projects. And one of our first was the Pedestrian Safety in Action Plan. It was the largest ever done in the United States, and we took a deep dive into the data. We looked at 7,000 crashes. It became a kind of Rosetta Stone for safety, the sort of who, what, when, where, and why of crashes. And we used that to target uh, where we needed uh, to make investments to improve the safety of our streets. And our goal was to reduce traffic fatalities by 50%. It was the first time that a large U.S. city had actually committed to a number rather than the idea that we'll reduce traffic fatalities. And the next administration is actually building on that with Vision Zero, taking a page out of your book uh, on Vision Zero. And I'm happy to say that the vision that you have here in Stockholm and Sweden has uh, spread around the world, uh, and it's really exciting to see. And it really is helping steer public ad, uh, attitudes about public safety and traffic violence. This is a map of some of our work. We redesigned 137 corridors and 113 intersections uh, with great results, a 30% decrease um, in traffic fatalities since 2001. But we didn't just stop at safety. Um, we really looked at measuring the economic impact of our investments. And we, have, we had a new report that we created called Measuring the Streets, which cataloged the new metrics that we used uh, to measure the results. And you can find this report and its methodology uh, online. 
And I think it's really important to note that these strategies, all of the strategies that we did, did not lead to Carmageddon. Um, we were able to show that actually, despite all of the changes that we made in Midtown Manhattan, traffic speeds improved 10%. And city after city has seen similar results. You can see the benefits uh, in reports from Toronto and Vancouver uh, to Bristol and Grants. And research is showing how often um, merchants overestimate the uh, number of uh, customers that are coming to their store uh, and overvalue parking, coming to their store by uh, driving. Heavy uh, car traffic does not equal heavy commerce. And you're seeing this in Seattle, which is putting in bike lanes, removing parking, and seeing sales rocketing. In Auckland, where their new street designs boosted retail sales by 50%. Melbourne found that uh, bikes uh, make more trips than drivers and uh, are a lot easier to fit into the streetscape. And when it comes to cyclists, there's the idea of safety in numbers, which is really important, but uh, there's also plenty of spending uh, that comes along with cyclists as well. And I know Alexander and his team uh, at Spacescape are crunching some of the same numbers uh, here in Stockholm. So these strategies that we've got in New York City don't depend on who is the mayor or who is the transportation commissioner. They're all codified into a new street design guide uh, for New York City. So anybody that touches the street, whether it's in the public sector or the private sector, has to follow this new playbook. And these designs are being adopted all over the United States now, thanks to NACTO, the National Association of City Transportation Officials, which is a group comprised of the transportation commissioners from the top 40 uh, largest cities in the United States. And uh, it used to be that our old design guides didn't let you innovate with protected lanes and a lot of the interventions that we talked about here. Uh, and so we wrote a new guidebook. And that was just recently adopted by USDOT. I encourage you to get a copy of this if you um, are interested. And also, if you're interested, let me know because we are doing a global street design guide, which will be coming out in October this year. And so we're looking for people uh, to serve on, uh, to review the guide and be part of our new uh, expert uh, network. So let me know. Uh, the core of this new vision is actually putting people on two feet and two wheels uh, ahead of cars. And it kind of flips the old hierarchy on its head. And it takes street designs like these and bu builds in better balance and better mobility and better safety. Uh, I had the pleasure of biking around um, the city yesterday with Alexander and Daniel and Tobias and saw the great bones that this city has. I mean, part of it's, I mean, everybody in Scandinavia has great bones, right? But you, you're, you've got great bones on your streets. And I think you really do have the basic foundation for creating a world-class, uh, walkable, bikeable, uh, transit-rich city. And, you know, the saga of the Slauson seems to be moving to the next stage, um, thanks to the firm commitment of the mayor. And I think it really is an opportunity to move beyond the kind of 1930s uh, design uh, where, you know, traffic circles in the center of the city seem to be a good idea. And, but I do think that it takes guts to overcome some of the loud opposition, um, especially if those voices are world famous uh, and nostalgic for a place that only a Volvo could love. Uh, I'm not talking about ABBA, no. <laughs> So, you know, the way you design uh, your streets and public spaces and infrastructure says a lot about who you are. And Swedes are known for marrying design excellence and, and function. I mean, look at your airport. You know, <laughs> you know, I'm an urbanist by nature, so I'm always looking uh, at new ideas in cities. I, and I usually, it usually takes me to till I get to the center of the city and till I start taking pictures. Um, but here, I didn't even make it to customs before I started taking pictures of like the flooring and the benches and the lights. Uh, it's just, it's, it's extraordinary. Uh, the design that you have here, the talent here, the beauty uh, that you bring uh, to your city. And I think projects like the new city line, you know, which will give millions of uh, people new transit options um, are really important. And they're not just nice to have. Um, they are critical for the economic development and the safety and the quality of life of this city. And 
you know, now is the time to try new things, to tap into the energy that is hidden in plain sight in your streets. You can reimagine and remake Stockholm from the ground up. You have the vision, you have the leadership, and with the energy and commitment of everyone in this room, you can make it happen. You must. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.